This is the V8 Radio Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Oste, joined as always by our esteemed co-host, Mr. Mike Cubal clark Good afternoon, sir. And uh, we have another special guest in studio at a very special location here at the PRI Show, Miss Kelly Oste. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Hi, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, uh, it is a special episode because we're on location here in uh, Indiana at the... Uh, Lucas Oil Convention Center for the PRI show, the Professional Racing Industry Show. And it's one of my favorite events of the year. Uh, And we're going to chat a little bit about this show and a little bit about uh, some special things happening with our V8 Speed and Resto Shop throughout 2024. I can't wait. Yeah. Let's do this. We are doing this. But for those who uh, frequently listen to the V8 Radio Podcast, you will know that we start off each and every episode with an automotive trivia question, right? Where we ask these in the beginning of the program, and then uh, we make people sit to the end to get the answer, because that's really about the only value of the show. Way to sell it, Osti. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're supposed to disagree. Uh, so have you guys, in fact, prepared trivia questions? I yes. have. Kelly, have you Yeah, prepared? I did. Well, right on. Well, since you're our guest, we're going to let you go first. I thought I was, all right, whatever. Uh, okay, so I want to know in what year and who the person is that was the first woman licensed to drive the top fuel dragster. Ooh. What Ooh. year? What year was she licensed? What year was she licensed? And who? Okay, I'm going to take a stab at this. And I'm going to say the person, I'm going to say Shirley Muldowney. And the year... 1969. Okay. Kevin, what's your guess? Man, this is one of those sleeper questions that I, I do not know the answer to because it's not going to be somebody that's super famous, is my guess. Yeah. Uh, Probably. There, that's the only name that came to mind, unfortunately. <laughs> no, it's a great guess. And, and, uh, Us girls are catching up. but Shirley definitely deserves all the, the credit for everything she did, and, and as does everybody who gets behind the wheel of one of those machines. But, you know, thinking back, there were a lot of other people that did get licensed that didn't enjoy the publicity, you know. Just because you have a license and you drive a car doesn't make you a competitor or a champion or, or whatever, True. right? Good a lot point. of people have a license and they're you know, barely ever been down the track. So I, I am completely lost on this one. This is a, a great question. I have no freaking idea. You're at the Performance Racing Industry Show, <laughs> Kevin. I know, <laughs> but, but one of the, the beauty aspects of this industry is how big it is yes and just how many people enjoy racing and get out there to do stuff so i'm gonna say how do i say a name of a person i don't know (laughs) florence fleming okay in uh, 1971 fast flow that's right got it okay i like it the infamous fast flow okay all right all right groovy jeez mike yeah nice one roll it nice one you got it Okay, so they were a lifelong sponsor of our good friend Richard Petty, and that would be STP. Mm. What does STP stand for? Ooh, and uh, because we are courteous, we're going to throw this out to our guest first. St- STP. <laughs> ah, ah, super. Super. Tight. <laughs> <Tie. laughs> no, that's not. Um, super top performance. No. Uh, super. Something about slippery, I feel slippery. like. Slippery. <laughs> mm. Slippery. This is a slippery question. It I is. don't know. Sorry. Standard. Standard. Temperature product. I don't know. <laughs> uh, that's not a bad guess. <laughs> That's also the initials of the first female top fuel drag series. Right. <laughs> STP. Yeah. Uh, All right, Mr. Wh- Osti. Did you get that, what she said? Yep, standard yep. temperature product. <laughs> okay. It's a standard temperature product. Yep. Mm-hmm. Something you can rely on. Super temperature. It's standard. It's standard. Okay. Something. Okay. Uh, I'm going to say it stands for cyan. Well, I think it changed. I think initially it was specially treated petroleum, and then it ended up being scientifically treated petroleum. Oh, Scientifically, so I'm going to stay with scientifically treated petroleum. Okay. Treated. STP, the petroleum. Racer's Edge, right? That's right. Heck yeah, man. Osti, what's your question? I use STP uh, often. Their uh, oil treatment adds a little ZDDP action to a nice. flat tap at cam motor to the van. Our '79 oh, Dodge yeah. van is drinking STP all the time. 
Uh, okay, so my question to you is, <laughs> what year was the very first PRI show? Dun, dun, dun. Oh, Look around man. for signage real quick. <laughs> I'm going to get kicked out of here. <laughs> Looking to do the math on a sign. Huh? <laughs> uh, okay, I'm going to say uh, 19... Mm-hmm. 75. 1975. Mm. Mr. Cubo? If this was the price is right, I may, I, I'd bid $1. Uh-huh. Um, dun, let's dun, see. Dun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's go with 1976. Ah. 1976. Great. Can you record both of those? Because I don't have a pen. Yep. He's got it. I'm on it. All right. Well, tune in to the end of the show to find the answers of these riveting trivia questions and other nonsense. <laughs> As, <laughs> as we get there mm. on VA Radio. So, Sell it. We got that out of the way. Uh, so the PRI show. Kelly, what do you think? Oh, it's the best show. I love it. I uh, learn so much here that uh, applies back to our shop. And I meet people who are just generous with their knowledge. It's incredible. I love the show. What, uh, what's on the agenda here for you at PRI this year? All things machine shop. Uh-huh. Mm. So our struggle has always been whether we buy something new or we have something fixed somewhere else or a customer brings us a motor that they had done. What we always do is we install it in the car, hook everything up, then we start it, and then we have to physically go out on the street and test drive and tune. And that gets kind of hairy sometimes. And, you know, you never know what the squeak, the rattle, the leak, the whatever is, and it causes a ton of non-billable time and frustration and delay. So I am looking for testing equipment to figure out if we machine the engine or um, one is brought to us or we buy something new to what can we do to test it to make sure that the squeaks and leaks and all those things are fixed before it goes into the vehicle. Mm, it's all about quality control. Yes. Yeah. And, and that is a thing because even when you get an engine that was dyno tested on an engine stand somewhere, when you put it in the car, it seems like You know, mile 20 is when they start leaking. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, this gentleman that I spoke to this morning at RMC, he was telling me that this machine runs it at 300 RPM. And for at least three, four minutes, maybe, um, it does all of its little testing things. And he goes, oh, we have some customers that run it for 30 seconds. I'm like, what do you get in 30 seconds? Like, the oil hasn't even reached all the areas yet, maybe, you know, I don't know. So uh, we want to find ways to test them and make them reliable and uh, eliminate a lot of frustrations. That's cool. So um, we've uh, recently expanded into the engine machining side of things at our V8 Speed and Resto shop. It's Mm -hmm. a big step. Last year, you were here uh, talking with people about the rest of the machines. Yes. Last year, I hadn't purchased any machines yet. I walked the floors. Uh, There's like six aisles to machinery row. I think I walked them at least 15 times each way. Mm-hmm. And um, talked to so many people and learned if it was a good idea to buy the machines that I was interested in. Um, I bought additional machines that weren't available in the machine shops that I did purchase. And just learned how they worked and what uh, each one would do and how it would work and what <coughs> engines we could work on, what engines we couldn't work on. Um, like I said, everybody was just so free with the information that they shared with me. And it was really helpful to... Then in, uh, I left PRI, and in March and April, I went out and bought um, two engine machine shops from two retired gentlemen, mm. and uh, we moved them through the summer, lined them all up, and laid out our machine shop, and now the electrician is in-house plugging everything in. Yeah, that was a heck of a project. It's been a project. <laughs> so how was it uh, approaching manufacturers in an area that you're interested in, but you know you didn't have a background in machining? Uh, to to get that information here because that can be intimidating. It's like it's like going to a uh, a craft brewery and not knowing anything about the beer. You don't want to be looked as you know like right. looked down on for ordering the wrong thing. How dare you? Yeah. Well, I was just fortunate. I went up and I said, I don't know anything about this. Tell me how this works. And if you, I feel like if you, as an individual, male or female, it doesn't matter. If you're willing to be curious and ask questions and listen. Um, I think people are more free with that information and willing to help you. If you go in with a know-it-all attitude or or just don't want to listen to what they're saying, you're not going to get that free information and that help. Um, So I don't know. Maybe I just walked up and asked the right questions and and found the right person. But last year was incredible with what I learned. Well, you had kind of a magic moment, too, because 
you came all the way to Indianapolis to the PRI show to learn about a shop that was for sale right down the street from us, basically, <laughs> right? Yeah, that was pretty cool. Someone, I had uh, one machine shop I was interested in, and uh, this gentleman, you know, kind of, we were walking down the aisle and people bump into you, you know, and this guy was like, hey, are you Kelly? I'm like, yeah, who are you? Hey, I heard you're interested in buying a machine shop and I know of one. I'm like, okay, that's great. And no, it's like your neighbor. <laughs> so it turned out we went back home, called the guy and he was an older gentleman. He didn't have any access to posting something on the internet. He'd been trying to sell it just, I guess, through word of mouth for a while. And uh, I contacted him and, and he was shocked that it was a female calling to buy his business, but it worked out really well. He's a great guy. Yeah, that, that was really interesting. And, and so he and, and the other gentleman who mm-hmm. owned the other shop were both retiring out. Yes. That was their whole, uh, their end game was uh, to sell the machines. And, and the other shop was a gentleman who had built a lot of race engines and originally was down in, in North Carolina. Yes. And uh, he didn't really want to sell. No. He had his, uh, the, the stereotypical situation for engine machining guys and a lot of people in our industry is they don't have a succession plan. They think they're going to run it till they're dead. And then who knows what's going to happen to their equipment. And um, neither of these guys had succession plans. The one gentleman, he thought his son was going to run it. And unfortunately, his son passed from COVID. And he didn't have another plan. Um, And he did not really want to stop working. But his body would not let him stand at the machines and operate them long term anymore. So it took a while. And eventually, I read some books. And I talked to some professionals. And it just turned out that he just needed to know that his business was going to go on and it wasn't just going to shut the doors and sell it at auction and who knows be split up like we really had to talk to him about how much we were going to care for his machines and what we were going to do with them and keep them together and um, grow our business and that 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 was his succession plan was seeing it continue and so once we got to the emotional side of things it, it worked out well, and that was the key there, and, and you said it. I mean, this man spent his whole life putting this business together and this whole shop and hand-selecting the machines and just setting them up the right way. And for those who, who do machine work, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, it's not so much that the machine is leveled and, and balanced, but also you know where you keep the tools, the, the custom tooling you've made over the years and, and all those little nuances. And then to think somebody might just come in and auction the stuff off or, you know, sell it for scrap or whatever. Right. That's that's hard to get your mind around. It is. And it's always hard to put a dollar amount on what you've done for 20 years. Right. You've been in that room. You've worked on those machines. You've done 20 or more years, more than yeah. 20 years. Um, and right. to and to suggest a dollar amount is enough. Um, it, that's hard. That's a lot. There's a lot of emotions to buying a business or buying equipment from someone like that. Yeah. So, you know, the PRI show is, uh, you know, kind of what I think was the inception for the process to to start going down that road of looking at going into that business, Uh, because we're primarily a restoration muscle car performance shop. We build customs and hot rods and muscle cars and pro touring cars and street driven stuff. And uh, the, the need that we had, as you alluded to earlier, is a lot of times we're getting engines in that uh, were hard to build. You know, if, uh, if a car had to have its numbers matching engine, we've got one right now, a 1971 Oldsmobile with a 350. And it's not like it's a super exotic, you know, or, or very significant engine that you're afraid to work on. It's just local machine shops won't take them. They're, you know, mm-hmm. they, they want to do cylinder heads for modern Hondas and stuff. And it, they're right. just not interested in doing it. So part of the impetus was, well, if we could offer that service in-house... That's one more thing that we can control, and it's another part of the service we can provide to our customers of letting them know and taking them on that journey of, of building an engine in addition to restoring the car and doing the interior work and all the metal work and fabrication and paint and all the rest. Uh, I also think that, as we had talked about this, the concept of taking them on that journey is big because how many times have you sent an engine off to a shop and it just goes into this void. <laughs> well, I don't know, Mike. Can you tell us about that? Like, how long did you lose your motor for? About two years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and that gets back to, you know, what you were saying, Kelly, about how all the people in this, I'm going to say everybody here at this show, at the PRI show, also at the SEMA show or, or any of the automotive trade shows, these are businesses that got started by people with a passion. Right. 
So it was started by somebody who liked to race or go fast or somebody who liked to tune engines or, or work on them. These types of businesses in the automotive side are rarely started by a couple of guys with business degrees that say, hey, you know what we should do? You know? <laughs> yeah, we should hire a bunch of employees and manage them and uh, figure out how to pay taxes and insurance. Like, what? <laughs> Nobody talks about that. Right. And, and as you grow from doing an individual engine at a time in your little shop and, you know, if you're good at it, that's the thing. People want more of them and more of them requires more people and more space and more equipment. Now, now you got to talk to you know, the insurance people and the finance people and the bank and you need real estate and all this stuff. And pretty soon that person who was the expert machinist that started doing the business are, is no longer able to work on the machines because they're managing the people and they're talking to the lawyer and the insurance person and all that. So in this case, um, you have been doing quite a bit to help businesses as we're going through our own arc of, of progress over the years because 2024 is going to be our 20th year in business. Can you believe that, Mike? That is amazing. It is amazing. It's pretty exciting. It is exciting, and I'm glad I get to be a part of that. We are too. Yeah, thanks. You know, PRI is a very special show for me now because it was one year ago today <laughs> where I was told I was going to come work for the VHB and Resto Shop legitimately. I think you were voluntold. Right? I was voluntold, <laughs> pretty it's much. Like, well, what else have you got going I didn't, on? I didn't put up much of a fight, yeah, yeah. to be honest. What do you think about working for us, Mike? <laughs> yeah, here's a guy who wasn't actively looking for a, a job change, and uh, Kelly just kind of looks at him and goes, hey, wait a minute. We need more help. Yeah, let's do this. Yeah. Yeah. I said, okay, let's do it. <laughs> that was the long short of it right there. Right. Well, I haven't looked back since. No, no, not at all. So it's been six months, and uh, I, I hope that you don't regret your decision. No, not at all. Okay, I good. know uh, what's interesting, though, is the reason I was planning to hire you was because of the engine machine shop exactly. growth. Mm. And uh, we haven't ordered a machine shop part yet. No, we haven't. And you're still already working a 40-hour oh, yep. work yeah. week. <laughs> yeah, we're still busy. So I don't know what's going to happen when we add another division. because well, we're going to get busier. You're going to be so busier. That's fine. <laughs> I look forward to that. That's good. Well, the fun thing is, again, Mike's a passionate guy, and you're into this stuff, and, and you've got your experiences, and that's what, that's what matters. And all of these businesses are running on people that just really dig this stuff. And when you look back, in our case, of, of you know 20 years ago, so basically this week in uh, 2003, um, I had left my position at Hot Rod Magazine TV in California and Kelly you left the position at the law firm you're working at in LA and we decided to make a go of it we decided to start a television production company and we created a, a TV show called VATV and and it aired on uh, some cable and satellite channels dish and direct can you are those still even in business right now dish network and direct yes. TV? Yes. I think they are yeah but this is long before YouTube and long yeah. before streaming and long before any of that stuff and uh, we were doing a half an hour television show uh, every other week um, about restoring a car. And the original concept, when you think back, is we were going to go to a bunch of different shops and kind of follow around the progress of different builds. And we would get there and we got a whole camera crew standing there. And, you know, this is long before you could shoot anything on a phone. You know, you had to right. hire a crew with a, a, a digi beta cam and a sound guy and the whole thing. Yeah. So it was a lot of money to go shoot something. And then the parts wouldn't be there or, <laughs> you know, that guy's sick today or whatever. And I got a deadline that is ticking like crazy. So we ended up uh, taking another leap and bringing all of that in-house and deciding to build a car just for our show, just to have content. And it was a 1969 uh, Chevy Camaro, kind of a pro touring car. Yep. And it belonged to Royal Purple Synthetic Oil. And they ended up using this as a promotional car, and it was a SEMA car and the whole deal. And it had some firsts on it. Um, it had the very first Schwartz Precision Chassis oh, installed. Oh, cool. Which we worked with Jeff Schwartz and those guys yeah. to help figure that out and make it fit and all that jazz. Uh, but then after we aired those first episodes of, of building that car, which were shot on Kelly's parents' farm in a small farm shop, we didn't really have a place. Uh, until your parents graciously allowed us to take over one of the farm buildings, uh, people would watch a show and they'd call us and say, hey, build me a car. Oh, oh. okay. So this is happening. Yeah. And, and looking back as I entered the PRI 
you know the main hall over there earlier today it dawned on me that uh to get going we needed to sell some commercial time on this television program to cover mm-hmm. those costs and some of our very first commercial sponsors were friends first and and sponsors second these are people that i had gotten to know and become friends with working in my previous life at hot rod so royal purple comp cams right. holly edelbrock msd it's crazy uh, and then htp welders yep. so here we are 20 years later all those companies are still in business they're still doing their thing and it's fun that we still work with them except now our shop has grown we have 30 people on staff we're building cars for people in five different countries right now and uh, we're buying all those parts yeah. from them. Every week we're buying stuff from the, all those companies. Yeah, every one. Yeah. And, and it's kind of funny because uh, I was talking with Bill Tishner at Holly, and I said, maybe this proves that I wasn't completely full of crap when I called you <laughs> <laughs> 20 years ago saying, right. I, I got this idea for a show uh, because here we are. Uh, and then he pointed out that uh, all of the money that they invested in buying commercial time on our show, we've paid them back and then some buying parts from them over the years as we grew. Sure. It, it's amazing how when you first started out as a television production company, how many hurdles you'd have to jump over just to get your content on the air, all the equipment you had to have, all the editing you had to do. And now think the technology, how it is today, how much easier it is and how many more avenues there are to get that content out. It's amazing. And the kids today just don't understand. They just don't get it. I'll tell you what, kids. Yeah. When we started this, the, the word content didn't exist. No. Which, by the way, to you uh, content creators, I have a bone to pick with the word content. Because content to me is just the time between the beginning and the end. You're creating stuff. You're making stories and articles and, and mm. films and movies. It's not just content. I mean, come on. <laughs> Here we go. Get ready for the angry uh, phone calls. I'm, uh, I'm off the... Now uh, we know the delicate button yeah. on OST. I'm so. off, the, uh, <laughs> off the soapbox. But... Okay. Uh, so, and it, but then, you know, Kelly, you evolved from being, you know, completely hands-on in the beginning, working on those first cars, mm-hmm. doing the body work, doing some of the fabrication. In fact, our, our body jig, as we, we repaired all the body panels on that 69 Camaro, you built the jig and painted right. it and, and did all the fabrication. I just learned that the other day. Yeah, yeah. that's how I learned how to weld. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, our friends, again, at, at HTP gave uh, a little welding school to use their stuff and Kelly took that and ran with it and was, you know, gluing everything together all over the place. It was fun. Yeah. Uh, and then to look back to see what you do today, um, it, you don't get, really get the chance very often to grab the welder that much anymore as much as you'd like to. No, I, my favorite department is the fabrication shop. Um, I, I love all the tools and the welding and the, and the metal shaping and it, I'm focused mostly on fit and finish. So lining up the panels and things like that is super important sure. to me and uh today i don't get to do any of that mm. <laughs> today i am on the keyboard looking at the screens um doing, the, doing a lot of math doing a lot of uh future planning i read my yellow notepad uh today before i came here and it was you know one to three year goal type setting and um You know, just a lot of planning and figuring things out to affect the entire company instead of just one car. Well, I think the the shift changed at some point where as soon as we started to pick up some employees and have some team members that that work together, it went from the car being the focus to those people being the focus and their families. And you took that on 100 percent, which is why you do all the time you do at the desk, making sure that. The benefits programs are, are there and they're right and everybody gets paid and, you know, the workplace culture is there. Yeah. So this morning um, you were upstairs at the, uh, what was the official title at breakfast? It was a student's breakfast. Um, kids from multiple high schools and colleges came to uh, the PRI show, obviously, to learn about our industry and see um, how their educations apply here, but they had a SEMA supported a, a PRI, I'm sorry, provided, provided a breakfast for the kids. Um, and they came in and there were multiple tables of different companies set up. And we just talked to them about what kind of careers we have in our shop. And there were other manufacturers and different businesses there that talked to them about um, what they make and how they make it and how whatever their education level could, um, 
participate in at their companies. And it was just kind of a conversation. It wasn't a job fair. It wasn't anything like that. It was just a conversation with the kids about what are you studying? Where do you live? Where do you want to, what do you want to learn? What are you interested in? And then make recommendations to them about maybe you could do this in your life or maybe you could do that. Or if you send me your information, I'll forward it to companies that I know that do that. Um, so, you know, a lot of times we think that, you know, kids today, whatever, there's a room of, I don't know, a hundred of them or so. So if you want to make the excuse about kids today, well, then just start talking to one of them because they do care and they are interested and they want to learn. And, uh, but people don't give them that opportunity a lot, you know? Um, so we worked with them. We talked to the, several of them and I watched all the other tables as well to have a lot of good conversations with the kids. My most impressive one was, uh, there, there was a table of, I think, six girls. Kevin even took a picture of them. And I was like, yeah, that's right. All the girls are standing around there listening to one guy talk about car parts and, oh boy. and their industry. And that's pretty awesome that, you know, um, the girls felt confident enough to go up to the table and learn as well Good. and not just kind of stand off to the side. And so that was pretty cool. Yeah, I think that was beneficial. And, and you were asking that one gal that came up, uh, she was actually studying finance. Yes. Which is a lot of what my job is. Um, and so I was asking what computer programs the, compu- the school is teaching them, or is it, you know, basic just learning the words, because I didn't do that, and I'm doing finance every day, so. <laughs> 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 I, maybe I should go back to school myself. But, um, you know, another conversations we had was their high school kids, and they're debating about going on to college or getting a job in the industry and asking, should I go to college? Do I need a degree? Uh, one girl was taking physical therapy classes and she said, would it be advantageous to me to get an automotive degree if I wanted to do physical therapy on race car drivers? I'm oh, like, yeah. well, yeah, because you're going to know what hurts and yeah. why, and you're going to give them tips and tricks on how to do something differently to not injure their body. So absolutely go get it. Yeah. The whole world of uh, race car ergonomics. Yeah. Uh, that, that, there's a huge opportunity there, I think. I think so, too. Yeah. Well, and, you know, we've said it over and over again that um, a lot of people look at the automotive world, either in racing or manufacturing or, or repair shops or custom shops, whatnot, and they don't see past the wrenches and the welders right. and the spray guns. But what it really takes is every, absolutely every job position you can imagine is required in this industry. Yes. Until today, I didn't think that physical therapy factored into that, but I guess I was wrong. Well, there are nurses in large, large companies, manufacturing facilities. There are nurses that work their job in the manufacturing facility. So you can go get a medical degree and you could be around car parts or you can be Mm -hmm. in the hospital or a doctor's office, whatever. So pretty much, you know, especially finance, bookkeeping, all of the, um, our most recent hire was a HR and culture coordinator and culture coordinator is like the new buzzy word around the world, you know, like culture, I don't think that job, I don't think that job existed 10 years ago, but, um, culture coordinator is super important in anybody hiring in any industry right now to improve the culture in your company and keep your employees top of mind and, and take care of them. And HR, I mean, tons of people go get HR degrees. And where do you want to work? Do you want to work in a hot run shop where you might get a test drive once in a while? Or do you want to work in a, you know, the dentist office is like my worst fear. <laughs> you don't want to <laughs> test drive anything in the dentist office. No, well, I don't not. want to, I don't want any job in the dentist office. You don't have to be just the dentist. You know, they have support staff as well. And so does the, the hot rod industry. We need a lot of support staff as well. So, you know, what do you find when we, we talk to other shop owners who, uh, at whatever size or stage of their, their game, uh, that are having challenges? What are some resources? Because we were just talking about students, but even seasoned professionals, uh, what kind of resources are out there for them to be able to get some help to either identify what their challenges are or, you know, just get past some of this stuff? Honestly, not much. Um, and that's why I'm so passionate about trying to help them because we're 20 years in business next year and I had to go to other industries and reach out to other leadership training and other business organizations that had absolutely nothing to do with the automotive industry to learn how to run our company and do it better. And so the automotive industry is really suffering with that. And like you said earlier, we're all passion driven. 
And when you have something that you are passionate about, you don't care if you're making money. You don't care how much time you're not spending with your family. You don't care if you are uh, working a million hours and exhausting your body. You are passionate about that. And so you put everything else to the side. And maybe you're not calling your customers back. Maybe you're not ordering your parts timely. Maybe you're not, your cash flow is wonky and you're like, oh gosh, how am I going to make payroll next week? But there are other industries out there that have a lot of training and a lot of focus on those kind of things. And we don't, we just want to build the most amazing, beautiful car or the fastest one or go to the next race or whatever. And oftentimes that creates other problems. So I'm really passionate about go out and do that race, build that amazing thing, but also take care of yourself (laughs) and your family and your employees and your customers and build great relationships with your vendors. These are all things that a lot of people don't think about. As much as I'd like to think that, uh, you know, we were a billion dollar company, we are certainly Mm. not. No. Um, But you met with the CEO of a billion dollar construction company and found out you guys had similar problems. Yes. So the business group (laughs) that I'm in, it's called Vistage and it's a I think it's a worldwide organization. It's a CEO and they have different levels. So if you're like a uh, owner or an employee, there's different levels you can go to. And we meet once a month and we sit in a conference room and uh, there's different levels. Like you said, a billion dollar company and, and me in the room. And I'm like, what am I going to share with you that you're going to learn from? But we all acknowledge that we all are struggling with the same things. Employees is always top topic, uh, insurance, taxes, Regulations, regulations, um, government or uh, state. Uh, there's a gentleman in my group that uh, has to do with the railroad industry. You want to talk about regulations? Holy cow! Oh boy! Um, and then like property. I mean, there's all kinds of things that I learn every time I go to these meetings, and I bring it back, and I think, how can that apply to us? And uh, there's not a lot of people that in the automotive industry that have take advantage of that or know about it, and so that's why I'm passionate about trying to share the information I've learned and help others. So in, in a way to share that information with other businesses, uh, you're also doing a lot with, with SEMA. I am. I'm on the uh, Hot Rod Industry Alliance Select Committee, and our focus has been primarily to help the builders because uh, HRA recognizes that SEMA is full of a lot of manufacturers, but who buys those parts are the builders. Mm. And so those the builders are an important part of anything in the automotive industry. And so we are trying to help them have successful businesses so that they continue to buy the parts and build great things. I think it's fun to, uh, you get to that point where when you're first starting out, at least this was, you know, kind of our story, we weren't really listing our storefront on Main Street USA saying, hi, we're here, we build custom cars. You know, we were just kind of doing what we were doing. Uh, But as you continue on, you you start to learn that people become kind of secretive of the knowledge that they they've accumulated because Mm. it's valuable. You know, it's it's sweat equity and blood, sweat and tears that that were the fuel to to learn this stuff. But as you progress and and as you, you know, your business matures a little bit, I think that's when we start to see other businesses willing to mentor uh, younger people and and actually help them out and not consider them as competition, but more of collaboration. And I think that's where you're at now. Well, and I've been at it for a while. Fortunately, with your marketing machine and interviewing builders and interviewing manufacturers, we've made those relationships. And I now can and have for a long time been able to go up to a builder. One of my favorite stories is asking Mike Ring how he sanded a certain area of this Mustang. And he was so frustrated with me (laughs) because all of his other, he was happy about it actually, but all of his other interviews were like, oh, it's, that's so pretty and that's so neat and tell me about the motor. And and I was like, Mike, how did you sand that spot? And he was like, son of a gun, you caught that? Like, and he told me the whole story. He used actually wrap sandpaper on a socket. Um, Mm -hmm. And he appreciated that I paid attention to that detail, right? So then we built this relationship that I can go to him and ask him about a paint company or a paint product or how to do something. Um, and then other people, it's it's something about their business or uh, something to do with marketing or advertising or finances or anything. And because we've built those relationships, we've communicated over the years, um, people are just willing to share that. But I think a lot of it has to do with being willing and listening and curious um, of, and hearing their stories too. 
and valuing what they tell you and then putting it into play. Right. And not just burning their time. Right. So if somebody's, you know, got a question, you know, it's the end of the year. And I know in the state that we live in, uh, in January, all of the uh, employment laws seem to change. Oh, <laughs> don't remind me. Yes, there's some big ones changing in Illinois. So what would you tell a shop owner? I mean, first of all, do they even know about it? A lot of people don't know about it. But if you're in Illinois, there are a lot of um, employment law changes. There are some websites that send out, uh, if you have workers' comp insurance at all, your workers' comp insurance company should put you on like an emailing list of changes like that. Um, I get a newsletter of all the changes. So sometimes I'm like, oh, thank gosh, we're not in Utah. They just did whatever, you know. <laughs> um, so it's staying in touch with your serv- your insurance companies, your service providers, and asking them what's new or what's going on that you need to know about. Um, I also have an HR consultant that helps me give us advice as well on um, legal matters and reviews our employee handbook and things like that too. Do you think it'd be uh, a, a good idea to uh, just pick up the phone and call another shop? Uh, yes. I mean, uh, you can ask, but like how I, I would have never known if I didn't have the newsletter sent to me or my HR consultant sent to me, I would have still never known to even call a shop and be like, hey, you don't have any labor laws changing in January? Like, <laughs> I wouldn't have thought of that. Yeah. And I've been in business 20 years. I would not have thought of that. So thank goodness I have resources that called me. And that's that's part of that relationship. That's part of that networking um, that somebody sends you like, hey, this affects you. Maybe I, maybe you should know about it. And I think a lot of that stuff can happen right here. Yes. It makes you wonder how many businesses are operating outside of those new laws just because they simply don't know. Yeah. There yeah. are so many businesses doing things that they are unaware of yeah. that in that right. case are illegal. Sure. Uh, but in other cases are just not best practice. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, because it's the way that it was always done or they just had no, no concept to ask. Right. Uh, but the PRI show in particular is a great one to talk to manufacturers and talk to people that are doing whatever it is um, because it's a chance to network, compare stories, learn stuff, and just have a, a you know, for lack of a better term, sometimes you can, you can get a good shoulder to cry on here of somebody who's already <laughs> been through it that is willing to help you out. Uh, and that's what's so great about the racing community is, you know, although we compete with each other on the track, you know, off the track, we're all in the same boat together. We're in this giant industry that is very special because it is made up of passionate people who just want to do the best they can, and they don't want to be in the rest of the world. You know, there's too many other types. Like you said, I don't really want to work in a dentist's office. <laughs> I like to tell our team that uh, the shop is their safe place for at least eight hours a day. Yes. Like you can get in there. You can focus on you know, cut well grind or wrenching something and whatever the heck you left at home or what you heard on the radio or whatever, it's not happening in our shop. So you just take that break. You know, when you hear about a, you think about a typical mechanic shop, quote unquote, you know, you, you hear, you think about, you know, people throwing tools or cussing and yelling and just losing it because something's not going right. I have never once heard any of that kind of thing at the V8 speed shop. Anytime I've been there, every time I visited, the culture that's there is everybody works together and I've never seen anybody get that upset about anything. Oh, I'm sure it's happened. I don't think so. I don't think we're a wrench throwing facility. No. No. I used to put that in the job ads, actually. Wrench throwers need not apply. I I remember seeing that a long time ago. (laughs) Because we didn't need that toxic environment in our our shop. And I I think our guys stay pretty cool-headed. Well, another thing that uh, we we started doing this past year, which, um, again, Kelly brought to the table, uh, coming out of that book, Traction, the entrepreneurial operating system, was the core value concept. And core values to me was another one of these, you know, marketing corporate buzzword terms of the week. You know, yeah, we got our core value statement on the wall. Who cares? Uh, but in reality, yeah, what, what we ended up finding is that uh, distilling that down, the core values are really just some, some ideas and some principles that you, you stand for. And we threw it out to the team and had everybody kind of write their own list of, of core values of things that they believed in. So you know, quality and innovation and respect and happiness. And and really, out of all the people on the team, we, we tasked them for writing, I don't know, seven or eight of these things. And we only ended up with like 20 different terms because so many of them crossed over. So we already shared so many core values. There was a, an individual, one guy who did not do the exercise. 
and happened to kind of weed himself off the team. You know, oh boy. He doesn't fit there. Nope. Uh, and there was another one who was a little bit outside of the box, um, so his didn't quite line up that well. But at the end of the day, today, we use that as, a, as kind of a metric. And if, if you're a person who – we're not talking about your skill set or what your abilities are. Just as a person, if you believe wholeheartedly in these things, that you want to do something of high quality and you're respectful of other people, uh, then, then you can be on the team if you have the skills. And initially, we used to hire for skills first and then the person second. And we learned that at one point we had this amazing painter. The guy was brilliant, but he was horrible to be around. And it just, it was like everybody walking on eggshells and, and didn't care about deadlines or the customer or none of it. But when you flip that and say, okay, well, if you're a solid person to start with, oh, and, and we found this one's a great painter. Now the whole team gets along. And this is what you observed, Mike, of being in the shop and yep. how people are complimentary to each other not only you know i'm not saying saying nice things all the time but right. workplace complimentary sure. you know that they're able to do a task hand off to the next guy receive a task uh-huh. from somebody else receive some insights or or if right. something could be done better somebody points it out some feed forward some feed forward yeah because uh-huh. it's, it's a solid team you know and then we took that to the next step and applied it to our customers so as people reach out to us to have a have us build their dream car if they line up with those core values again, we know that we're going to be able to communicate effectively and, and share that experience in a way where you're not fighting them right out of the box, you know. And then it went to the next level of all the vendors that we deal with and, and different companies that we buy and sell parts. And, uh, and, and so all of a sudden we've achieved this kind of operational harmony. There you go. There's a new one. Operational like it. harmony. And uh, it just manifests itself in, in a day of work that things go a lot smoother just because the machine works so again i gotta you, you read the book on it and uh, and shared it with us and in the beginning i was like what and then now i'm like oh yeah i mean how do how do, how do we do it without this before you know it's a great book and it's uh difficult because it makes you think about 10 years out and what your goals are and uh that's a pretty difficult thing for a lot of people to think about, but it sets you up so that you can envision 10 years and then five and three and one and then 90 days. And uh, there's so much great information in that book that really is very helpful to planning the future of your business. There are times when I can't think about 10 minutes from now. (laughs) And that was the hardest one for me was a 10 year for sure. Yeah. Uh, But that's a different story. Uh, So, you know, kind of looking back, we're entering, like I said, the 20th year of our business. Would you, I never envisioned, I couldn't envision 20 years out just on in time, much less the things that have happened and the people we've worked with, and the cars we've built and the way the shop has grown and in the interior shop and into the machine shop and everything else. What, uh, what do you look at when you kind of look back at that? I know we don't take a lot of time to do it. but Well, when we started the business, I did not think even a year out that I can think of. I I didn't have any idea where it was going, how big it was going to go. Only within the last three and a half, four years, have I significantly focused on the future of the business and really put a ton of effort into making sure that even if, you know, we both drove here together in the same car. If something happened to both of us at the same time, uh, my goal is our company continue and take care of our employees and take care of our customers and continue on infinity. I would love it, but I don't know how we're going to do that. But <laughs> <laughs> so that's been my goal is to set it up so that it continues to go on uh, whether I'm there or not. Well, I think you're, you're well poised at this point uh, with the, the team and the structure and creating all the policies and procedures. And, and back in the, in the past when I had a regular corporate job and they would talk about policies and procedures, my eyes would roll back in my head. And I'd want to put a fork in my eye. But today, it's, no, 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 this is just the how to do it. This is just, in case we're not there, here's how to do it. And well, in no way do I want to run a, a military-type business. But the military, if you want to look at how to run a business, <laughs> I mean, look at how long they've been going. Look at how successful they've been in a lot of situations. And they have policies and procedures. They have written instructions on how to do seemingly everything. And everybody has to follow that. I I can attest to that. Right. And so when I looked at that, at it that way, I thought, well, there is a lot of companies or a lot of organizations that have policies and procedures that 
are done the same way every time and it prevents a lot of chaos. Yeah. So that's the reason why I wrote them. Well, and that's the benefit. And it doesn't matter if you're an engine builder or if you're a chassis shop or if you're a race team. If everybody knows what the goal is and everybody knows the, the tried and true steps to get there, you'll get there. Right. And checklists are super important too, I think. Yeah. Antron Brown gave me a great interview about a lot of the policies and the procedures that they go through in their top fuel team uh, to be successful. And, and, you know, here was a guy who started a team and, and finished near the top the first year out because uh, he was just a genius at putting a team together and, and having people believe in each other and focus on that goal and get there. So there's a lot to that. Well, I'm, uh, I'm excited. I appreciate all of the efforts that you've put in and that you've decided to take on all these challenges in different directions because I'm, I'm not necessarily the most comfortable person growing in different directions and trying stuff. Uh, but it's always worked and it continues to. So thank you for that. Why are you laughing, Mike? <laughs> Uh, no reason. No reason, nothing. Mm -mm. No, you're a direct uh, result of that, my friend. Yeah, of me being willing to grow. Oh, for sure. I mean, yeah. look look how, since, since you, you say to that in the last three or four years, you've really been focusing on the growth of the company. And look what's happened yeah. in just those three or four years. It's amazing. It's, it's almost exponential. Well, I know when I first hired our sales guy and said, I can't talk to all the customers anymore. I just can't keep no. up. And I was ordering parts, talking to the sales guys, doing all the bookkeeping, all the financials, every aspect of ordering all the equipment and everything. And uh, we hired that sales guy and he started answering the phone. I was like, oh, I got I got a couple hours of my life back. This is amazing. Yeah. And then we um, hired our first parts guy. And I, I missed I missed ordering the parts. I really did enjoy doing that. Um, and then the other administrative help that we have, it's just allowed me to focus differently on the future of the company. And um, <coughs> I, I'm eternally grateful for that because I wonder if I couldn't have, if I would have tried to still order all the parts and talk to the sales guys and, you know, every customer and all the things like, I don't know. I don't think it had been a good situation. <laughs> you know, seeing as how well the company is running now and getting back to your love of the fabrication shop, maybe you should at least once a week or once a month, go back there and start grinding some metal and making stuff. <laughs> uh, I would love it, but I'm and, not sure you know, that the team would like it. I think therapy. they'd be like, what are yeah, you doing in here? Good spiritually, <laughs> it'll be good for everything. It was I'm really, sure they would love to see you back there. It was really good for me. I just spent about six weeks, five weeks in our uh, parts storage warehouse recently. And that was really awesome for me. And mm -hmm. they're like, I've said, you know, I'm going to just bring my laptop out here, out here and hide for once in a while. And they welcome me every time. But I really did enjoy working hands on with them again and, yeah. you know, hands on the parts and just making those decisions and stuff that I haven't yeah. had to do. What in a, a positive time. change that was back yeah. there. Yeah. Well, Huge. You, and you identified things that were not going smoothly because you were put you put yourself in it. You were doing the job. Right. And to do it. And that's, you know, some advice to business owners. If you are growing and you haven't been in a department for a while, go work in that department for a while and learn and listen to your employees about what their struggles are, what their frustrations are. And you might see something that nobody else has seen. But I had a lot of answers for, well, we're going to do it this way now. Um, and they they're so happy yeah. <laughs> that I was out there for a while to fix some things. Well, you're a fixer for sure. Well, I, on the on the flip side of that, if people are left to their own devices they can come up with great solutions for problems that maybe you didn't even know were happening absolutely and they 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 see it and they're like okay we got to fix this and they and they work together as a team and they do it yeah that's the most rewarding part when i see that uh somebody on our team has made a decision or or come up with a process of their own and they're it's working and they're and they're all building it together yeah, they take ownership they, yeah. this is how we're doing it now yeah write yeah. it down Yep. And and we're we're fortunate that there's a you were talking about culture. The culture is such that that's embraced. We we want sure. that to happen because the opposite is when you you go to a place and somebody's working and they're like, oh man, management has no idea what's going on back here. Well, we're we gonna <laughs> right. change it. No, I ain't doing nothing, man. You're it's not right. my job. No, in our case, it's hey, can we do this? Because we need to do this. Great, yes. do it, do it. Yeah. Well, our mission statement at uh, V8 Speed and Resto is to connect people to the best times of their lives through things with wheels. And it's a lofty goal, uh, and it's something we try to do every day. We're getting there. Uh, we've made a lot of people very happy with their dream cars, uh, but that also reflects internally to the team that work on those cars and, uh, and all of us, too. And I can't think of a, a better place to reflect on this than here at the PRI show because that this industry is made of people following their dreams either in 
parts or racing or manufacturing uh, or just being around other racers and people they look up to. So this was uh, nice to kind of walk down memory lane a little bit. And, yeah, that's and, cool. And chat uh, and hopefully shed a little bit of light on some things that, that we learned that Kelly's always willing to share. So uh, what would you recommend people to, uh, to join like the HRA? Of course, I recommend they join the HRIA. Uh, you can reach out to me or SEMA's website has um, a link that you can fill out the application form. If you're a SEMA member, it's an additional $100. Um, join it, and we have all kinds of educational opportunities where we go to good guys shows and NSRA shows and uh, have classes, and we're going to start working on classes that help business owners as well. Um, nice. We are also helping all the students try to find um, places for them to apply or businesses that maybe it's a little harder to find that they're hiring. Because, um, you know, avenues like Indeed and stuff like that's expensive. So a lot of us small shop owners are like, ah, we're just going to tell some friends that we're trying to hire somebody. Well, yeah, so. there's not a lot of race, <laughs> race jobs available on Indeed. Right, right. right. So yeah. we're just trying to help all avenues of the industry. And so they can reach out to me personally um, through our website, and I'll be glad to help them anyway. Right on. But you know what everybody's really mm. here for? Tell that me. is the answer to our silly automotive trivia questions. <laughs> and uh, we, we threw these out in the beginning. Here, here come the answers. So, uh, uh, Kelly, I guess you go first with your mind-bending question. Okay. So the question was, who and what year was the first woman licensed to drive the top fuel dragster? The answer is Shirley Melody. Oh, yeah. In 1973. And I think that oh, is so man. awesome. that Back then, I mean, 1973, 50 years ago. she had the guts to walk yeah. out on a drag strip and get licensed and race and she set tons of records and did a phenomenal career in her uh, racing world for sure and i think a lot of um men and women look up to what she accomplished and uh, i think that's pretty cool back in 1973 yeah. heart like a wheel was a great movie to uh, showcase that yep yep yeah for sure all right well congratulations mike you got that one right well, half of it anyway Ish. yeah uh, <laughs> all right mike what did you have all right, I asked y'all what STP stands for. Oh, yes. And uh, Kevin said... Um, scientifically? Scientifically treated petroleum. Uh -huh. And Kelly said standard temp product. <laughs> mm. I couldn't think fast Stellar enough. answers, I know. both. <laughs> However, incorrect. STP stands for science, technology, performance. Oh, okay. now maybe, it makes total sense. Maybe today. What does that mean back then? It's changed over the years. Well... During my research, that's what came up. Okay. Uh -huh. Research what STP meant in uh, 1975. Well, I didn't my ask goodness. you what it meant in 1975. Oh, now, did I? Oh, my goodness. I asked you what it means now. You did ask me now what it means. Yeah. <laughs> what does it stand for? <laughs> Science, technology, performance. You know what? Don't. You don't want this smoke, Ghosty. Scientifically you don't want treated it. petroleum. It's going to be a smoke show, and I'm in the gentlemen. middle. <laughs> it's uh, unusual for me to contest, but uh, oh, no, I might have not. it torn it down. You know what? If, I'll, I'll do some more digging, and if you are right, I will concede that on our next show. You'll send a message to Yardley and tell him to change the points. Yeah, right, okay. to change the stats. Yeah, okay. All right, all right. <laughs> Osti, what's yours? So my question to y'alls was, when was the very first PRI show held? When was it? Mm. And Mike, uh, so you said... I said 1976. And Kelly I said, said 75. 1975. Yeah, 1988. 88? Oh wow, yeah. these guys are younger than I thought. Well, it's 88 was a few minutes ago. Yeah. This is a well-established show. What do you mean? Yeah. 88 was like yesterday. It feels like yesterday. <laughs> I know. To, to Don't those start of us that with it. me. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, thanks for uh, for playing along. I would like to do a special shout out to our good friend Miss Linda Vaughn, who is coming through the PRI show area right now, smiling and waving like she's always Hi, Linda. done. Linda, she's blowing kisses to you, Kevin. Yeah, she does it to everybody, and, <laughs> and it's wonderful. It's great to see her. Thank you for that. Another legend of our industry. Yeah, right here at the PRI show. So hey, uh, this was fun. Thanks for for sharing some time. Uh, thanks for listening and hanging out with us and and uh, letting us. Uh, tell our story a little bit and, and share some insights on working in the automotive industry and the performance side and the passion side uh, here at the 2023 PRI show. For Mr. Mike Cubal clark and Kelly Oste, I'm Kevin Oste. This is the V8 Radio Podcast. If you like this kind of thing, you can hit the subscribe button and then another episode will magically appear in your inbox and uh, just like that, yeah, on any platform. Uh, and... Uh, you can always feel free to leave us a good review or some stars if you like. There's no extra charge for that. It's all the same <laughs> price. 
So thanks again for tuning in. I'm Kevin Oste, and uh, keep the shiny side up, and we will talk to you next time on the V8 Radio Podcast.